interim executive director. I recognize a lot of people here, but I think there's some new people here as well. So welcome to the museum if you've not been here before. Um, I would like to, well, first of all, welcome to our lecture series. I wanted to also let you know that um, um, we have, oh, well, we have membership forms, by the way. Leave them by the door. If anybody wants one and is not a member of the museum, there are all sorts of benefits associated, and we hope that you'll uh, you'll join us. Um, and also, we're going to pass around our um, attendance list, and if you will put your email address down so that you can, if, you, if you're here, you most likely got a copy of the lecture flyer or the newsletter, but if you are not on our list, please put your email down. Um, I would like, I'm going to introduce Kristen Jospel tonight, who is, she's the one that organized this lecture, and I would like for her to introduce our guests. So thank you very much for being here, and enjoy the lecture. Hi, like she said, I'm Kristen Jospel, Director of Operations, and this is Justin Barca and Jessica Sticka. And they are from the Texas A&M Conservation Research Lab. And they will be giving a lecture on the recovery conservation exhibition of the Civil War gunboat USS Westfield. And, uh, Sounds good to me. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> good. Good. <coughs> we'll start a little bit differently today, guys. Just for you. Jessica maybe do this. <clears throat> My lads, I have called you together to tell you that there is a rumor afloat that an attempt will be made some of these nights to drive us from the harbor by some rebel steamers. I have reason to believe that there is some truth in the rumor. Now what I want to impress upon you is that you must keep your eyes wide open to prevent a surprise. Be ready at your guns at the first alarm. I know I have a good crew. I couldn't wish for a better set of men. But here in an enemy's country, I can't impress it upon your minds too strongly to be vigilant. If we are attacked at all, it will be by boats drawing very little water. And they may come upon us without coming through the channel. And their object will be to board us. So you must keep your eyes all around you for if they get alongside before we are ready to receive them, or before our anchor is up, they may stand a pretty good job of succeeding. But if we are underway, I know, with the good stout engine of the Westfield and her gallant crew, we can sink and destroy a good half dozen of them. I am fully determined not to be driven from here, and I know you will stand by me to the last to prevent such a thing. I have not the least doubt of your bravery. I have had sufficient proofs of that. But what I want to impress upon you is to be, if possible, more vigilant. As I said before, if they catch us napping, they may succeed. But if we are wide awake when they come, I'll be damned if they will. Commander William B. Renshaw, November 1862, aboard the flagship USS Westfield. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Westfield Project. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the news clippings that have been coming in since 2009. This is what we would call Texas's largest rescue maritime archaeology project to date. This was done in advance of a major dredging operation by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to widen and deepen the Texas City Ship Channel and part of the Houston Ship Channel. I'm sure as you guys can see walking around this museum with some of these oil tanker models, how large some of these beasts are. The draft on some of these vessels is 40 feet or more. The channel is, was about 45 feet. 
So some of these vessels are just barely scraping by the bottom to get to Texas City and Galveston. So the time came and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decided it was uh, time to redo the channel. And the one thing that they were praying that they would not find is the West Bank. <laughs> and they did. Go ahead. So, to start off, Westfield was originally a Staten Island gunboat. Here I am blocking your view, I apologize. It was originally a Staten Island gunboat, I'm sorry, a Staten Island ferry that traveled between uh, Manhattan and Staten Island. It was of a line of ferry boats built by famous Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, these vessels were built for weight built to carry a lot of people back and forth daily, just like the modern ferries that you have uh, traveling to Staten Island today. Um, we don't actually know what Westfield looked like. We never actually found an image of it, or so we say that. Jessica and I just got back from a week and a half long research trip in New York looking for an image of her. And we may have found one, we're not sure. We're still waiting for the higher resolution images to come in so we can analyze them. But all we have is a small sketch of her as a gunboat, but not as a ferry boat. So in order to understand what she looked like, we're comparing her to some of her sister ships, although these are later sister ships built in the same design, but not necessarily exactly as Westfield appeared. As I said, the Corps was hoping not to find her, but they did. Uh, she was marked on previous charts, and then over time she just became known as a wreck, as a navigational hazard. Um, so when they found her, because she was a U.S. Navy ship, the U.S. Navy never lets go of one of their vessels, as you guys probably know, like the Arizona and Hawaii. It's a war, war grave. So in order to, you can't, you can't keep her there because you have to have modern progress. So the way they mitigated this was they had to bring up the entire ship. So, but anyway, to start, just to give you a general idea, this is the Northfield. This is a few years after Westfield. Westfield was built in 1861. Uh, Northfield, probably about 63, maybe 64, but of a similar design. So this will give you a general idea of what Westfield looked like um, before her conversion. This is not much, but this is what Jess and I found in New York. Um, this amongst many other pictures. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, after thousands and thousands of dollars <laughs> going to New York, we found uh, quite a few images of these vessels here. And I know it's very grainy, but we think that this might be the only physical photo that exists of Westfield. And what makes this even more unique is that there's a ship dock next to her of identical design. And again, we have to analyze this, but if that's true, that may be her sister ship Clifton, which any of you who might be Civil War buffs may know of Clifton as the ship that sank uh, near Sabine Pass, or possibly in Sabine Pass, I can't remember. Um, so once we get this picture, and we should be getting it in the next few weeks, we will put it under some more scrutiny, try to clean up the image and see what kind of details we get out of it. These Staten Island ferry boats were kind of a pet project of Cornelius Vanderbilt. It's not like the school bus appearance that you see on these modern Staten Island ferry boats. Cornelius treated these boats as a hobby, and he would invest tons of money into them. So they were very, very luxurious on the inside. A lot of wood paneling. Um, this, this is a little bit of a later shot, more from the 90s, I believe, the 1890s, but it gives you an idea of the type of money that was put into them. It's the Victorian age, and they made these boats, even though they were transports, very glamorous, very comfortable. When the war broke out, we were used to, our Navy was used to fighting in open water, deep water. We had the mindset of the Europeans. How do you fight your enemy? You have men of war. You line them up, the other, your enemy lines up, and your ships go into broadside formation and beat the hell out of each other. And that's how you win a battle. You try to beat them, you know, uh, sink as many of them or put them out of action. The problem is that fighting technique would be outdated for the Civil War. 
because now we're not fighting with in deep waters or deep harbors. We're fighting in our own backyard. We're fighting in shallow rivers, uh, shallow bays. Any of you sea Aggies that are out there, you know how shallow Galveston is. I heard you talking about Matagorda Bay. You were talking about how shallow it was. You said 15 feet, about 12 feet. So you, how are you going to get a ship like, uh, like, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Merrimack, the USS Merrimack that would later become the CSS Virginia. The Merrimack class vessel was a very impressive. She was screw driven propeller and she had three masts capable of sail. She, could, she had smooth bore cannon, uh, could uh, deliver an impressive broadside and a perfect fighting machine. You cannot take her into the Mississippi. You cannot take her into Galveston. So these deep draft vessels were becoming obsolete as the Civil War was starting to become naval. So what did the Navy do? They decided quickly that they were gonna have to find a lot of shallow draft vessels. So they started frantically buying up any shallow draft vessels they could. The ferry boats became a perfect solution to that. Built for a lot of people, built to carry a lot of weight, horse teams, they were perfect for carrying heavy armaments, troops, they could transport them anywhere, and the best part was they had a shallow draft, generally about eight feet. So you could mount heavy guns on them and get your troops anywhere you needed. Now as I said, we don't actually have an image confirmed yet of Westfield, but this is a sketch that we have that we believe was drawn by a, a U.S. Navy Marine that was serving on board. Um, this is an image of Southfield, also slightly later in years, um, but it kind of gives you an idea. If these are identical vessels, you can see what the Navy did to her. They purchased her, and then they cut off her upper deck Based, based on what we're getting from this lower photo. They cut off, cut off her upper saloon deck, they lowered down her main cabin, and they got rid of the large windows for passengers. Instead, replaced them with small portholes, which would protect the inner officer's quarters. And then to make it officially a warship, they took boiler plating, and they put it all the way around the bulwarks of the vessel. This protected the main cabin, some of the machinery, and then at the bow and the stern, actually bow and stern on a double-ended ferry boat, you don't really have a bow, but they associate the smokestack as being the bow. Uh, at the bow and the stern, you would have folding plates. So the gun crews, if just like on a, any other warship where the port comes up, um, they would move the cannon to the position they wanted, they drop the necessary plates, they could fire out of that area, they'd bring the cannon back, bring the plates back up, shift the cannon, move more plates down, and they could fire from a different direction. These became perfect, very efficient warships. The only downside is they were operated by a walking beam engine, and by reducing the profile of the ship, the machinery became very vulnerable. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But this is just to show you kind of the changes that the Navy implemented on a simple Staten Island ferry boat, basically turning it into a low riding beast. Um, also, one of the main things is, how are you going to get a vessel like this down into the Gulf of Mexico? These things are not meant for open ocean. These things are meant for the shallow waters of New York. Uh, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with uh, river boats, paddle wheelers. We see a lot of, uh, of them still in, in existence uh, as museums, also in the Mississippi. Um, we have sponsons that hold up an upper deck. The upper deck is wider than the lower deck. So it's almost like a platform sitting on a hull. So the sponsons hold it up like stanchions, if you will, and they're kind of at an angle. What they did was they enclosed the sponsons and created an outer hull, if that makes sense. So basically this permitted these vessels to go out into the deep water, barely, and take the trip all the way down the coast into the Gulf of Mexico where they would engage in naval battles uh, in, the, in the shallower waters. But getting them down there was the trick. Most of these vessels would barely make it down there intact and quite a few ferry boats were purchased for this sort of service. To give you a general idea again of the conversion process, Amy Borgens, actually our state maritime archaeologist, put this animation together. This is Westfield number two. 
the replacement ship. But the animation shows how they removed the saloon deck, covered up the main windows, and put armaments all around her. Can we run one more time? So by the time she came down to fight in Texas, this is what she would have looked like, completely converted into a warship. This is the USS Commodore McDonald. This is a much smaller vessel, but this is the closest representation to what I believe Westfield would have looked like, based off of um, our artifact assemblage that was recovered from the vessel, other photographs, pictures of ferry boats at the time, other conversions. She doesn't have a walking beam engine, as you can see here, this big diamond. She's got an inclined engine buried deep in the hull, but the appearance is the same. Again, much smaller, about probably 175 feet, whereas Westfield was about 225 feet long and about 213 feet at the waterline because of that overhanging deck. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Civil War starts, and the U.S. Navy purchases Westfield from Cornelius Vanderbilt for $90,000 in November of 1861. And as Justin mentioned, Westfield was converted from a ferry boat to a gunboat and was commissioned on February 13, 1862. Now, with the rest of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, she was sent down to the Gulf to capture New Orleans to allow the Union Navy to control the Mississippi. Westfield, with her shallow draft, was very useful in pulling the deeper draft steamers and sailing ships over the sandbar, through the passes, and into the river. The sailing ships in the squadron alone took two weeks to scrape over the sandbar. Now, unfortunately, the capture of New Orleans is outside the scope of this presentation, but I wanted to mention one very important use of Westfield during the battle. Her use came in extinguishing fire rafts, which were sent down the, uh, the river by the Confederates to kind of cause general confusion and distract the Union ships from bombarding Forts Jackson and St. Philip that were there. And so the, these rafts would come down the river and the ships like Westfield would immediately sail out to them and spray water through their hoses onto the ships to extinguish them before they could cause any damage. Let me just add one other thing. As I was saying earlier, our fleet was, we had these Merrimack class vessels, these large ships like the Wabash, the Merrimack, and uh, the Minnesota. Uh, you're never going to be able to get them into the Mississippi, and this is what the Confederates were kind of counting on. They were basically, they knew that we would not be able to get our fleets in range of their forts, much less New Orleans. But bringing these ferry boats down and transporting these ships over the pass. It wasn't the Merrimack class, it was the Hartford class. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the, uh, some of you have the USS Hartford. Um, it was the prototype for other vessels of the same class, like the USS Brooklyn. The Confederates couldn't believe their eyes um, when they finally looked out to the Mississippi, and not only did you have small steamers, but you had these deeper draft vessels, these Hartford class ships that were basically sloops of war, and for all intents and purposes, men of war. So after the capture of New Orleans, Westfield and the West Gulf Blockading Squadron moved down to Texas aiming to capture Galveston. Now, while the Union blockade of Galveston had existed since July of 1861, it wasn't until October 4th of 1862 that Navy ships actually entered the harbor to demand surrender of the town. And after exchanging a bit of fire, Confederate Colonel Joseph Cook agreed to a truce of four days in order to evacuate women, children, and foreigners from the town. After Westfield took Galveston, she went systematically up and down the coast and started taking uh, port towns, small coves, um, and there wasn't many Confederate uh, forts to be able to stop her, or ships. So we had our blockade fleet past the barrier islands. Like I said, these deep draft vessels, they couldn't get close to land. So they would sit there and they would stop the blockaders from, I'm sorry, not the blockaders, the blockade runners 
from going in and bringing their goods or, or, or getting their goods out to the open ocean. Um, so the, small, so that the forts that they did have, I hate to say it, but the Confederates kind of got lazy. They just didn't expect anything to happen. At Matagorda Bay, for instance, one day they're in Fort Esperanza and they see two ships coming down, thank you Jess, two ships coming down, uh, tw uh, down the coastline uh, outside of Matagorda Island and Peninsula and suddenly turn in towards Matagorda Bay. Well, they start aiming their guns on them, thinking this won't be a problem. We've stopped all these ships before. So instead, Westfield and Clifton, being the shallow draft vessels that they are, just go outside the channel uh, at a safe distance to where the fort, Fort Esperanza, cannot fire on them, and basically pummel the fort to the point where the uh, defenders decided it would be more prudent to retreat and retreat back to Indianola. Clifton and Westfield steamed uninhibited straight into Matagorda, took Indianola with a fight. It was mainly populated by uh, Germans at the time. They didn't want to have any part of our civil war. So they basically said, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to have anything to do with it. You can come where we don't want to sell you anything, but just leave us alone, be on your way. So some say that they, they shelled Indianola, but more historical records say that that did not happen, that they basically just left on a truce. On that, uh, Clifton and Westfield were hoping that when they went up to Lavaca, the situation would be the same. But no, you had some very fierce Confederates there. They were not allowed, about to let their town go without a fight. So the moment Westfield and Clifton got close, they started getting shelled from the town. And a fierce exchange continued for several days. Um, this is a picture of Port Lavaca in the lower right corner. Westfield and Clifton shelling from a distance. And at this time, one of Westfield's main guns, a 100-pound parrot rifle, yes, that's right, a 100-pound parrot rifle, I don't know if anybody of you guys have seen a picture of that, it's a massive gun, um, exploded. Uh, I don't believe anybody was killed, but it was enough uh, to where they had to start considering retreat to get new armaments. So they, the real reason was not the gun, and then finally that they simply ran out of ammo, although the Confederates until the end of the war were convinced that they chased these steamers out of the bay. You guys can debate on that. <laughs> so, at the end of December 1862, Westfield, Clifton, and of course the Harriet Lane and some of the other Union ships were stationed back in Galveston Bay. Now, unbeknownst to the Union, four Confederate ships, including Bayou City and Neptune, were up in Buffalo Bayou waiting for orders. Uh, the Confederates got their chance to attack at 3 a.m. New Year's Day, 1863. Uh, a major aboard the Mary Boardman of one of the Union vessels was the first to spot the Confederate cottonclads as they made their way down the bay, and signal rockets were sent up to warn the other Union ships and the Union troops on shore. By daybreak, uh, the Confederate ships were within a mile of Harriet Lane. The naval attack began when Bayou City rammed into the Harriet Lane twice, cutting a large hole in Lane's side. Neptune also headed straight for Harriet Lane, but was badly damaged in the collision, and the captain was forced to run her aground where she sank in eight feet of water. Um, Uh, so Harriet Lane, locked together with Bayou City, was stuck, and the Confederate soldiers quickly overtook the ship and turned Lane's guns on the other Union ships. In the attack, Captain Wainwright of Harriet Lane was killed. Uh, one attack said that a pistol ball passed in one of Captain Wainwright's eyes and out the back of his head. He was wearing his spectacles at the time, and an officer took them to Commodore Renshaw. One of the glasses was shot out while the other was covered with blood and flesh. Meanwhile, back on Galveston Island, 3,000 Confederate troops under General Magruder had crossed the bridge into Galveston, pulling 20 guns over the bridge themselves because the mules refused to cross. <laughs> they moved into position around a street some of you may know as the Strand near Coons Wharf, uh, about a quarter mile from where the Union soldiers were stationed. 
General Magruder was the first to fire a shot for the Battle of Galveston at the same moment that the Confederate ships were seen coming down the bay. At this point, it became a bit chaotic, to say the least. The Confederate soldiers waded into the water to surround the Union on the wharf. They brought ladders with them to climb onto the wharf. However, once they um, were applied next to it, they, the ladders actually sank into the mud, uh, causing them to be too short. And uh, the Confederates were unable to make it to the top of the wharf and had to retreat under Union fire. Uh, meanwhile, the Union ships were bombarding the city. One of Owasco's shells actually damaged the Henley building, which you can see here. So soon after, um, a truce was called by the Union, but due to a miscommunication, the Union soldiers on the wharf were taken as prisoner. So by 4 a.m., the Confederate ships were emerging from the bay. Captain Renshaw aboard the Westfield quickly got up steam to try and fight them off. But unfortunately, she grounded hard on the northeast side of Pelican Spit, what is now Pelican Island. Uh, Renshaw signaled uh, Clifton for help, but unfortunately, to no avail, she was unable to pull her off of the sand. When a truce was called, Renshaw was informed that the lane was lost, and he watched as the troops on Coon's Wharf were marched away as prisoners. On top of that, the Confederates were demanding the rest of the Union ships to be surrendered. Now, Renshaw couldn't let that happen. It would have been a great embarrassment to him and to the Union Navy. Commander David Farragut already didn't really like him very much. Uh, we can tell from Farragut's letters. So losing all of his ships in Galveston definitely wouldn't have helped his reputation. So the speech that you heard earlier from Renshaw, one of the main things that speech does is it kind of gives you a foreshadowing of what is to come in this battle. And sure enough, the captain was saying to be vigilant and to be awake, which these crew, his crew, they were. To their, to their credit, they were. This was just a very well planned out attack um, and a series of mis, mis, uh, unfortunate events for the Union just led to, uh, well, it led to what comes next. Knowing that this ship could not fall into Confederate hands, Renshaw decided he would have to scuttle. If this ship had fallen into Confederate hands, the Confederates could take Westfield because she was so heavily armored and protected uh, and systematically retake all of the ports and rivers that she had captured during her uh, time in Texas. So Captain Renshaw, Commander Renshaw, he battened down the safety valves and the boilers uh, in, the, in the hold so they would build up pressure. He poured turpentine all over the decks and then he had a powder trail going all the way to the forward magazine. The crew was evacuated. They had 15? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So they basically grabbed what they could and they got off. Renshaw stayed behind with 12 of his men, some officers, some gunners, um, basically to ensure the destruction of the ship. Now we're not exactly sure what happened next. Um, either the charges went off prematurely or they didn't go off and the captain went back to check. But what we do know is that the captain got to the longboat and he put a torch down and he hit the powder trail. At some point later, Westfield exploded. Renshaw and his crew in the longboat were incinerated. They died immediately. At that moment, the bow of Westfield blew off and just shattered it. There was nothing left of it. It wasn't an explosion per se, it was gunpowder burns quickly. It's not an explosive uh, substance that you see in the movies. Um, so the bow was just instantly shattered and gone. <coughs> and that's supported in the archaeological record. We didn't find much of it. Um, the stern hung around for a while longer just as a smoking mass in the water. And as pieces continued to rain down all over Galveston and the surrounding area from Westfield. For 10 minutes, there was a high-pitched screaming that got louder and louder and louder and louder. And then there was a second blinding flash. At this point, the boilers blew. And what was left of the stern just immediately went up in flames, burned down to the waterline, and slipped beneath the waves.
In 2009, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers decided it was time to dredge the channel, as we talked about earlier. As I said, this was the largest rescue operation that's ever been conducted in Texas. Um, I heard, as I was saying, you were talking about Bell earlier. Bell is a, it was a systematic excavation, something that was very well thought out. It was planned, a lot of money invested. It was a proper excavation. They had the time to do it. You cannot shut down the Texas City Ship Channel or the Houston Ship Channel, so they had to do this very quick. This is a federal and state project that was permitted by both the Texas Historical Commission, the United States Navy, and there's actually a whole bunch of other entities out there, but they had to do it very quickly and as efficiently as possible to not block traffic going into these major ports. This is actually uh, one of the guns that was recovered. The Westfield was heavily salvaged by the Confederates after she went down. Um, however, the Confederates knew what was on her during because of parlays. Whenever they, uh, whenever Confederate men, commanders, would go to talk to Confederate officers to try to negotiate, they were counting the guns on the vessel. So when she blew up, they went back to recover all the guns. However, in the middle of the night, one more Dahlgren was added from the Clifton and put onto a wooden Marsili carriage. Um, and that cannon was never accounted for. The Confederates didn't know to look for it. So we were lucky to recover this. Um, to give you an idea of the excavation size, these are BFIs, trash BFIs, the big ones that you see at construction sites. There's about six or seven right there. So that gives you an idea of the excavation platform uh, here in the Texas City Ship Channel. Unfortunately, as I said, it was not your perfect excavation. They had to work quickly, and they, uh, they used a clamshell and magnet to bring up most of it. Some of you might cringe at that, as archaeologists we do, um, because when that clamshell goes down, uh, you don't know what it's going to bring up or what it's going to destroy in the process. What they basically did was, based off of a side scan sonar map and GPS coordinates, they put a digital grid system over the excavation site and they used the clamshell to go down systematically into those grids and pull up the artifacts. Surprisingly, they did a very efficient job without damaging too much. Larger objects like the cannon or big pieces of the boilers, those were brought up uh, by cranes. Uh, diving was very limited. On a site like this, you have to dive well ahead of your mark because if you were to go straight down, the currents are going to uh, carry you. So you dive, you know, you dive 100 feet that way, and then the car by the time you get to the bottom, uh, you're going to be on your site. When she sank, she was in about 10, 12 feet of water. Um, however, when they built the Texas City Dyke, uh, it completely changed the currents of the bay. And what it ended up doing was causing this natural dredging effect, which scoured the site, carried out most of the smaller artifacts into the Gulf, leaving the bitter, bigger artifacts to be recovered in 2009. So she went from about 12 feet of water to 45 feet. So the artifacts just over the years just went down, down, down until the excavation. This is what came up, and this is what they gave me. <laughs> this is where I step in, and then Jessica shortly after. Um, rather than having this perfect archaeology project, they basically dropped a scrap file on my doorstep, and they wanted me to analyze it, go through it, and determine what needed to be conserved. So um, at the time, I was looking for a dissertation project. Nobody wanted to touch it. <laughs> I wasn't sure I did either. This is completely concreted iron. There's very little organic material in it. Most of it is from the machinery, as I said, mostly boiler components. You can see some fire grates. Everything is, com is covered in marine growth, and it's all very heavy. These are some of the pieces that came from the back of the boiler. And this just, I'm showing you these images just to kind of give you a, an idea of the disarticulated site of the, of, of the wreck. Basically, it's not a ship anymore. It's just a debris field. She blew up. She was scattered uh, through years of dredging operations before we had laws to protect these types of historic sites. Um, and then the excavation itself was you know, somewhat damaging to it. Right here we have the bottom of one of the two boilers. This, these, this would be one of your ovens, that would be one of your other ovens where you would basically shovel coal. I'm in there not to look pretty, but to kind of give you an idea of scale. 
and to show you um, next, what we're trying what we're trying to do now is to identify as many of these fragments as we possibly can to figure out how we can display them in the future. So what you're basically looking at in the other picture, the firebox, oops, sorry, is this piece right here, the very very bottom, um, where all the ash would have uh, fallen from the coal. So as we're going through, we're finding all these different pieces and going through hundreds and hundreds of manuals from the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, hoping to identify all these pieces that are completely concreted. Slowly but surely, we are doing that, and we are now starting to be able to reconstruct what the boiler would have looked like. Like right here, this is a coal door. This is a coal door frame. This is a frame. This is a coal door. So these objects go through conservation, which Jessica is going to talk about heavily shortly, and then we get them ready for museum display. So what do you do with thousands and thousands of concreted pieces of metal? So nobody wanted to touch this, and Jessica and I started talking about, well, how are we going to present this to you, the public? How are we going to make you guys understand? If you take a look at it, you're not going to understand individual pieces. So we've seen other reconstructions that have been done on other ships, and then I started thinking, I saw actually a Roman temple where the bottom was stone and the top they had wire frame to show what was missing. And then I got this idea, well, why don't we do the same thing with Westfield? So that's what we're doing. Basically, this is one of the boilers. We're going to build one side fake to show what we believe it looked like. The other side is going to be a wire frame. And we're going to incorporate all the artifacts into the wire frame hung from angle iron pieces um, to show how the boiler once looked. So everything that you see black here, these are going to be the actual artifacts that are going to be hung onto the wire frame in the position that they most likely occupied when the boiler was in use. We just got the contract on this. This is official. Um, Texas City is setting us up in their main museum. They're planning to take out about a hundred year loan on the artifacts. And we're going to be building one of the boilers, also one of the main, uh, also the main engine cylinder. This is going to be about a 20 foot tall display with thousands upon thousands of artifacts on it. Again, showing you how these pieces fit in. You wouldn't understand them individually, so you take, take them all together and it's a big jigsaw puzzle. Also, figuring out how the boiler actually looked. We're using other images that we find uh, during research. This is all that, uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, this is all that remained of Clifton, the sister ship. Um, or at least that was seen above the waterline at Sabine Pass. Sister ships, meaning same, same engine, same boilers. So from that image, we're able to reconstruct um, what the top of... Uh-oh, uh I got the wrong slide. You delete it. You deleted the wrong slide. Um, we were able to figure out what the top of the boiler looked like and what the different rivet patterns would be to figure out how she was designed. Texas City is not going to let me build a complete boiler inside their museum, or two of them, uh, so we're basically going to be building only about a five foot depth of the, of the front, the facade of the boiler. The thing would have originally been about 24 feet uh, long. So what we're going to do, like I said, half of it fake, half of it with artifacts, and part of the smokestack. Half of the smokestack, since it would have been shared by the other boiler. And this is how it will look approximately in the museum, with something painted on the other side to kind of ghost in the effect. To give you an idea of the boilers in relation to the overall vessel, that's how much of it is missing. Your 22-foot paddle wheels and your upper decks, um, well, as we mentioned, the upper deck was removed. So how does an engine like this work, and how do you figure out how it works, and how does it look when it's given to you like this? This is one of our main engine components. It's a pump. This is when it came up. It's concreted. We deconcrete it, and then we figure out how it fit in association with the engine based on going through these manuals, also photography from the time. So a lot of analysis goes into placing these artifacts on the reconstruction. Every artifact tells a story. These are all fragments and pieces. This is something from the engine cylinder. This is the base of the engine cylinder. This is that pump you saw. And this is one of the bearing blocks that would have ha held the massive diamond that powered your engine. So how does this engine work? Based on these fragments, this is the most likely appearance of Westfield's engine, about 43 feet long, uh, tall. Massive engine with a big diamond walking beam on top. 
We know the dimensions of the walking beam because Clifton's was actually recovered and it's in Sabine Pass now. So what happens is you have steam going from your boiler. You have Coleman basically feeding coal to your boiler and the steam is built up uh, through the fire and through the fire tubes and the steam goes into a steam chest where you have an engineer and he controls a stick on this walking beam engine and he pulls it down and he lets a small burst of steam into a massive cylinder. Westfield was 18 feet tall, much bigger than the engine cylinder in your car. So they would let a small burst of steam in and it would start expanding and your massive piston would start going down very slowly and then he would reverse that lever and send a small burst of steam in the bottom and that would expand starting to push the piston up and as he's doing that exhaust is leaving steam's going in and he keeps repeating the process and slowly but surely that massive piston starts moving very slowly now the entire engine is linked meaning if you get one part of it to move the whole thing will move. So if you can move this part, this part will move. It's like a bicycle chain, basically. So he sends in these bursts of steam, and as this piston starts moving, the big paddle wheels, the 22-foot tall paddle wheels, are moving against all the inertia, all the, uh, the, the physical force of the water. It's having to push all of this and get the engine in motion. And he starts speeding up the process and the piston starts going back and forth faster and faster and as it does that this connecting link goes to that diamond and just like those oil derricks that you see in the country that are going back and forth back and forth back and forth pivoting that's the same thing that the walking beam is doing it's connected to a, a crank that goes to a crankshaft which is attached to your paddle wheels so basically as the ship's in operation and your paddle wheels are turning, it's all because that diamond on top is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it was a very, very visual engine. Justin? Yes. May I ask you a big question? Uh, sure, go ahead. I'm wondering, so in effect, the throttle was a human. You know, I left out an important part. I was trying to save time. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Uh, at, st at first, you start the engine with those small bursts. And once the engineer feels that the engine has got up to a good pace to where it's smooth, it's in control, he does something known as dropping the hooks. And basically what that means is you have this, these, this hook system um, which he can drop onto a device which will take over the action that he was doing. You have an eccentric circle, a circle basically offset of the main uh, paddle wheel shaft. And as the thing is rotating offset, it's this eccentric rod, as it would call, would go back and forth, back and forth, and the hook would pull on the same thing he was doing and essentially put it on autopilot. However, to reverse the ship, you would have to go back to manual. Do you have any idea how many horsepower it generated? Not yet. That's actually something I'm investigating. <laughs> you know who built it? <laughs> uh, Morgan Ironworks. Where? Uh, Manhattan. Okay. In fact, that was one of the main things that Jessica and I were looking at when we were in New York. I'm frantically trying to find any kind of architectural drawings of the original engine. Based on the fragments, I think we did a pretty good job reconstructing what it looked like. Mm -hmm. It's very different than other walking beam engines. It's got a much longer arm. The axle is much lower. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, so carriages could go through the main cabin without being hindered by the paddle wheel shaft. Um, but Morgan Ironworks, the same Morgan who brought his ships into Texas on uh, these big steamships going into Indianola and Galveston. Um, Morgan ticked off Cornelius Vanderbilt. Jessica knows all about it. And what, what was this, what did he say to him? There was this, a story, and I don't know if I remember this entirely, but um, that uh, Charles, Vanderbilt left for Europe and Charles Morgan uh, had some sort of conspiracy with someone else where he, he planned to take some money from Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt found out about this and he came back and his famous line that he says is that He's not going to take him to court because courts take too long and they take too much money. Instead, he says, I'll ruin you. And he did. <laughs> he did ruin him. 
after the Civil War was over, Vanderbilt was able to buy back a lot of his older ships, um, and he just, like the Navy was doing, he dumped them on the market. And so rather than uh, Morgan being able to <coughs> build new engines, he had nobody else to serve anymore because you, already, you flood the market with all these already existing ships, uh, no new engines are needed. So Morgan sold his records to a guy named John Roach. So we, start, we stopped looking for Morgan, we started looking for John Roach, hoping that maybe with the this sale of the business, the papers went. Well, John Roach started making uh, bad warships, inefficient warships, and he knew what he was doing. So when he was facing a court indictment, his, his factory and all of his papers mysteriously caught on fire. And there's my records. Yes, so I can't, I don't have any records for Morgan, and it's one of the biggest, uh, one of my biggest uh, disappointments with this project. Uh, however, Clifton, even though there were sister ships, um, her engine was built in a different yard. Um, I think the reason was the other Morgan just had too many projects going on, so they decided to build it in a different yard. So now I'm chasing after the papers for this other company, hoping that if I can find the papers for Clifton, that that will help me finish the reconstruction for Westfield, since they are technically the same ship. we do on a daily basis? Well, all that's interesting. This I find the most interesting. <laughs> so we are conservators. We uh, treat the artifacts that we get into our lab. Uh, and these treatments are designed to help the artifact last as long as possible. But most importantly, they are reversible or retreatable methods of prolonging the life of the artifact. Now, conservation is essential for artifacts found in underwater sites. Once brought to the surface, if left to dry, the objects can start to break down and can literally crumble in a matter of hours. Now, conservation requirements vary depending on the type of artifact and its level of preservation, ranging from simple procedures, procedures to complicated multi-step treatments. Now, I won't get into too much complicated science behind that, but I did want to talk a little bit about some of our iron conservation. So by far most of the Westfield collection is made from iron. When iron corrodes underwater, the molecules break down and form a thick shell of, uh, around the artifact that we call concretion. Now in order to conserve the artifacts, this concretion is removed as you can see here. The picture in the top left is a piece of boilerplate with, or with rivets that you can see fully concreted, and then the one in the bottom right, uh, it the concretion has been removed. Now in some cases, which I, I might have some pictures of a little bit later, the iron isn't preserved anymore, and it's completely turned itself inside out into concretion. And to treat those, we actually fill the cavity that is created by the iron that is now concretion with epoxy, and that'll create a replica of the original artifact once that concretion is removed. Jess, can I add something to that? Sure. Um, the way I, I would think to, I'm not, if you said this already, I apologize, but basically the artifact turns itself completely inside out. Um, it's, it creates a natural mold of itself. The iron will find the, if, you, if you're making something as a blacksmith, um, forging something, and you're hammering it, it's going to create weak spots. Or as an engine part is being used, weak spots develop. And those are going to be the first places that the iron is going to start breaking down and bleeding out. And that's why you're going to get this pillow effect covering the artifact in denser areas uh, than, than other areas. So what you're left with is just this empty cavity because iron does not want to be iron. It wants to be a ferric compound. So, did you already say all that? Pretty much. Okay. Okay. So, one of the more, well, the less interesting parts of our job uh, comes with documentation, but it's actually one of the most important parts 
Uh, documentation and recording is a huge part of archaeology, even after the artifacts have been, ex uh, have been recorded in the field. For each artifact that we conserve, we fill out uh, the artifact card for all the information uh, of the conservation that we do. Uh, and the small artifacts are x-rayed, like the one in the top right corner, which allows us to see exactly what that artifact looks like underneath the concretion. So we can tell from this x-ray whether the iron still exists or whether we're going to have to fill in those cavities uh, to recreate the artifact. So you can see in the top right corner the x-ray and then the final product next to it. Uh, we also take photographs of the artifacts. Um, sorry, go ahead. Was the one up there, uh, is this an epoxy replica or is that the steel that came out of it? When you looked at the x-ray, did you see it was hollow or did you see it? With some of the Westfield artifacts, it's actually a bit complicated because when I initially would look at the x-ray in the top right corner, I would say that the iron isn't there. But once we removed the concretion on this artifact, I believe the iron was still present. It was just very difficult to see in the x-ray, which actually causes some of the Westfield artifacts to be very complicated. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit what I mean later, but in, in some cases, we actually have to remove the concretion from some areas where the iron is preserved, then in the next spot, just a little bit over, it's completely gone. So we have to fill that with epoxy, remove the concretion from the entire artifact, and then recast it in epoxy again. Uh, just the bearings. Oh, the bearings themselves are copper. So that's why you can see them so very, very bright in the x-ray, whereas the circle around the block uh, it almost looks black like a hollow. I know, I'm getting annoying. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that amphora that's in the back of the museum, but you can see the, uh, Kristen, was that the stock the, uh, from that anchor? Um, that, that's a concretion back there, and on your way out, you should take a look at that display. Um, there probably is no iron in that. That is probably completely marine concretion. Um, all the metal has most likely bled out of that, and that's just hollow throughout. So if that was to be cleaned out, uh, like Jessica was saying, and resin poured in, you would have an, a complete copy of the original. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. This is my favorite artifact of the entire collection, and it's rather small. Um, this we found concreted to a bolt. So we have that bolt that you can see up here that we x-rayed. And we thought it was just a bolt. Now we had been doing these for weeks. Uh, many, many bolts like this didn't think this one was anything special until we saw this in the x-ray. Now that's interesting. So we ended up doing a few more different views of the x-ray. And once the concretion was removed, we found this guy. Now this is a electroplated silver onto pewter pepper shaker or salt shaker top. It would have fit onto a glass base and would have been a part of a set like the one you can see in the lower right hand corner. This is actually from an antique book and it's from the right time period from 1861. So we believe it was part of a set, if not this set, uh, one very, very similar <coughs> to it. And as you can see, it's too ornate to be something that was given to the crew. We think this belonged to um, either the officer's table or the captain's table. So here we have some examples of our glass and ceramics. Um, as you can see, it's a, they're very fragmentary. We don't really have any whole vessels. Uh, we just have these small bits and pieces, except for one. This bottle in the lower right hand corner that you can see sitting on its side. Uh, it's sitting on its side for one very particular reason. The base is round, it is not flat. So it was never designed to sit upright. Uh, it would always sit on its side because this particular bottle would have held soda or mineral water. And so it sat on its side so that the liquid could actually keep the cork wet that was in the bottle. Because if, it, if the cork wasn't kept wet, it would shrink and the beverage would lose its carbonation. Now this one is a little bit, it is even more interesting because these bottles were not very popular until the 1870s all the way up into the early 1900s. 
So we're theorizing that this bottle was actually a remnant of the salvage work that was done later in the early 20th century. Not sure, just a theory, but that's what we think. Now the one in the top left corner is shown with some of its original concretion. We found this, we're able to remove the ceramic, and then you see this concretion here. And I think with the lighting, it's a little bit hard to see. But underneath that fabric, right along here, is an impression of fabric. Now the fabric is no longer there. All that's left is the impression that it left in the concretion. Um, so unfortunately, while I would have loved to preserve the concretion that is here, uh, it did not survive. And so the only evidence we have of this is the photograph that you can see in the image, which again is why documentation is so very, very important. <coughs> here we have a few of our clothing artifacts. Uh, you can see some clasps and hooks, um, a button in the lower left-hand corner. Um, the interesting one in the bottom right is called like a, a snake or swan loop uh, belt buckle. And these two pieces that we found here were actually found on opposite sides of the wreck. We're not sure if it came from the exact same buckle, but they're from a very similar one. Um, this one we couldn't figure out for the longest time. We thought it was some sort of fastener, maybe part of it was a chain link. Until uh, I think you saw an example at the, uh, the which one? Houston Museum, the big one. Um, yes. Um, and then we were able to identify the two different pieces. Uh, and let's see. Here's uh, some examples of the belt buckles, uh, the US belt buckles that we found on the wreck. And then these are the front and back of two examples. We have 10 altogether. And as you can see, these are a bit different from the typical ones that you would see with the copper plate attached. The copper didn't survive. All we are left with is the lead backing to the buckle. Uh, so we get a, a little bit of questions for that because they don't look the same. And it's, it's because the copper itself was not preserved, unfortunately. So this, we want to do something a little bit different. We want to get you guys kind of more involved and let you be the archaeologist. So what I've done is place some photos on some slides. And I wanted to show you this picture. Now the scale itself is in centimeters, so don't let that throw you. Um, that's just how we do our photos. So we're looking at a piece that's a, about this size. It's a bit, bit small. We we're wondering if anybody could help us with the identification on this. <laughs> Any suggestions? It, it's, it's a copper. Anything? Any ideas? Possibly from a candlestick or candle lamp. So exactly what it is. It's from a, from an oil lamp. So you can see it in the <laughs> So a couple more of our personal items. We have the key in the top right corner. You can see it's not a complete one. Most of our artifacts are fragmentary. <coughs> uh, then in the left slide, we think we have possibly part of a book. What we have is a few very small bits of paper uh, that we think were somehow burned and then a very thin copper sheet that we think was part of the cover. And then in the, in the lower left corner, the small piece you see here is the only one with any markings on it. And you can see the grid markings on that if, if you can look close enough. Um, we think it was some part of some sort of ledger possibly because of the grid markings, but we're not sure. So here's another one. This might be a little bit more complicated. It's very small. Yeah, it's very small. I'm sorry, I should include a picture of the scale. We're looking at something that's about this long. And then that, that small triangular piece is about that long. This is actually part of a frog that would have held um, the, your, what would you call it? Your bayonet. Your Not your scam, your bayonet. Bayonet to a, a belt. So the piece here in the background would have wrapped around the sheath on there, um, and then that would have held it into the leather pouch on your belt. Oh. That one took a while to find. Uh, we actually found the picture in a relic hunter's book. They have some great images of some of these uh, artifacts, and we, we have a bits and fragments. It's kind of like fitting a puzzle piece 
into the puzzle and figuring out what it is. This one might be a little bit easier. Any ideas? Again, the, the scale is in centimeters. Hmm? I'm sorry? No? Okay. Any other suggestions? It almost looks like a belt. Kind of. Tell them. Okay. Okay, if it wasn't bent. A knife. A knife without the handle. Now, why would you have a brass or copper knife? Actually, copper. Why would you have a copper knife? Gar. Very good. Exactly right. You don't want to cause a spark. So you would have a copper knife uh, that would be assigned to each of the uh, main gun crews. Mm. That's for basically the powder monkeys. So whenever they're cutting the fuses, uh, if they're, they wouldn't cut a spark that would ignite anything they were using. <clears throat> this one might be a little bit more complicated. This was a mystery for a while. It's about this long. It's just been identified. Not by us, actually. <laughs> this is why we're actually getting you guys to help us. <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah. Uh, Do you want to explain this one? Okay. Um, this is, what do you call this one? This is a trammel set. Basically, this is a, oh, too bad, sorry. This is a trammel set. Um, you would have had interchangeable pieces on the bottom. You could put a pencil, um, a little bit of lead on there. Uh, basically, yeah, for measurements, exactly. Uh, it's like a compass, basically. You can, a compass is, not, is only going to be able to open so far. But if you have a big chart and you're trying to chart a certain distance and you have to put it up to a scale, or if you have to draw a big circle saying, I'm going to be patrolling only within this area, um, but I've only got to go this far, you, you would have a little screw or something up here so this thing could slide and you could put it where you need it. Um, so you would have had two of them. So I thought it was a shaver of some kind, a razor blade or a mirror, and then uh, some gentleman a few weeks ago identified it for us. So this is just kind of a theor theoretical reconstruction we just quickly threw together. That's why the colors don't match, but it gives you a general idea how it would be used. All right, I'll try to talk a little bit louder so that everybody can hear me. All right, what about this one? And unfortunately, I don't have a scale again, but these are little pieces like this, and uh, the one on the right we think is the opposite end of the one on the left. So these are two fragments of what we think is the same thing. Any ideas on this one? L little small piece. We have actually have a few of them. This is actually one of our unidentified pieces uh, that we have a few of, but we always hope that somebody might have some sort of idea of what this is. We think it's some sort of tool, we're not sure. We also thought, you know, the belt buckle earlier was some sort of fastener and it turned out to be something completely different, so. Um, some of our other tools that we have is this iron hammerhead that you can see in the bottom right corner. And it actually has a bit of the wood handle that belonged to it. Um, and then in the left side of the slide, you can see two what, of what we think are bullet mold halves. We, ha we have some people who argue with us on this, and that's okay, but um, we're pretty sure that this, this is uh, two halves of a bullet mold. Uh, here's some of our files that we can serve. Now, both of these files are entirely made out of epoxy. This was more, one of the more complicated artifacts on the site, just due to the tiny, tiny teeth that are on these files. For the one at the bottom, I literally had to sit there with a, a small pneumatic chisel and just gently break each part of the concretion off of there to not even touch the artifact itself, but hopefully remove the concretion, um, you know, cleaving off of the top of the artifact without damaging the artifact itself. Then create a mold of that one side, flip it over, and remove the concretion from the other side. Um, the top one, there was no metal left in it whatsoever, so that cavity was cleaned out filled with epoxy, and the concretion was removed. Um, but both of them were, were quite complicated, and you can see the uh, fragments of what it once was. 
So we have one last one. Anybody has any idea on this one? Yep, they are what we call covered buttons. Um, so we fit, we didn't know what these were for a very long time. We thought they were some sort of wing nut or something. Um, and so we found in an 1865 catalog this picture. They look exactly the same today. Exactly, I know. It is something we can recognize from. After this was identified, I was putting some boxes back up in the attic, and I was so ticked off because I looked there and there, <laughs> there was. I've been looking at this for two years, and I had, we're archaeologists, uh, jacks of all trades, master of the nut. <laughs> so here we have a few more interesting artifacts, and this was a bit of a mystery for us. We found on the site what we thought were originally bolts, but they turned out to be sash weights. If you guys know what sash weights are, they, they assist in raising and lowering the windows, and they're in, inside the walls. Um, so these would have been part of, say, the big windows that were on Westfield. However, we also found the uh, part of the port porthole on the right side, and then the, the glass fragment that you can see in the bottom left. And so we were a bit confused. We couldn't figure out why we would have both have sash weights and the portholes. And it wasn't until we started figuring, figuring out um, more about the construction of the ship and the changes it underwent that we assumed that the sash weights were left inside uh, the walls of the hull before the portholes were installed. You got to remember how quickly this ship was converted. Um, what did you say last time? Three months? It's three months from November 22nd to February 13th. I don't know how many of you guys do house construction. Um, I used to do some uh, work on houses and we would take down a wall and there we would find a window that had been boarded up for a hundred years. And, uh, or we wouldn't find the window and we'd find a sash weight and a partial frame showing where the window was. So we think at the time of the conversion, they were in such a rush, the crude guys, when the foreman wasn't looking, they just cut the, cut the line, let it fall into the wall, and then they put up new planking. So some poor uh, officer, maybe whichever one they didn't like, would, when that ship was rocking, you'd probably just hear a knock, <laughs> knock, knock, knock. And of course I wanted to talk about our 9-inch Dahlgren cannon that we touched on a little bit earlier. During the Battle of Gallison, Westfield had two of these on board. The first one, we believe, sat on a pivot carriage, but to replace the 100-pound parrot gun that had exploded just a bit earlier, a second Dahlgren cannon was transferred from the Clifton to the Westfield just before the battle. Now this one, we believe, sat on a different carriage, a Marsili carriage that you can see in the lower right which is actually kind of a, a mock-up of our future uh, museum exhibit. Now, uh, and we also have numerous artifacts that support this type of carriage, which is why we've designed the museum ex exhibit to have this one. Now, due to the last-minute addition of this gun, the Confederates were unaware that the gun actually was on the ship. And so Confederate salvers didn't think to look for it under the debris that it was under, which is why we still have it today. So the, the 90, 9 inch Dahlgren gun was the most popular and versatile of the Dahlgren guns. It could fire a shell over a mile and a half away. And with the carriage, it weighed over five and a half tons and usually required a crew of 16. One of the things that's interesting about this gun was this was new technology at the time. Um, Gunpowder and the, the, the range that they were trying to acquire um, was considerably further than when you had that European style of fighting. Um, like you saw, you guys see the model of the HMS Victory in the other room, and you see how many guns that she has on her. They are meant to basically fire these big broadsides uh, and cripple each other. Well, by this time they're starting to think a little bit differently. What if we make our guns more powerful and make them and have fewer of them? Um, and that's what they started experimenting with. But by doing this, you require more gunpowder, um, and that's why these cannons take on this uh, uh, soda bottle shape. You have to reinforce the breech where the gunpowder goes uh, to ensure that when you ignite it, you're not going to cause the back of your cannon to explode from the pressure. Um, so you reinforce the breech, the muzzle stays the same. 
So at the beginning of the war, this was kind of new technology. It was very impressive, but by the end of the war, this was nothing special. These guns just kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this, I wouldn't call it a small gun by the end of the war, but it was by far not the most powerful. Uh, Justin? Yes, sir. The, you, she referred to a projectile or a shell. Was this an exploding shell or a solid ball? Yeah, um, I'm not sure when that started exactly. We, we haven't recovered any cannonballs. Everything that we recovered are shells. Um, and what we mean by that is, I mean, it looks like a cannonball. It, it's nine, we have nine inch diameter shells and eight inch diameter shells. The eight inch would have been for Columbia at Cannon. Um, it's basically a cannonball and a grenade. It's made out of very, very weak cast iron and the intent is basically to fire it like a cannonball, do the same kind of damage, punch a hole in your enemy ship, but then once you've punched your hole, it's got a secondary reaction and it explodes from a timed fuse and causes secondary damage to the crew and to the rest of the superstructure of the vessel. Um, on top, and we recovered, I think, 24, 25 live shells. Um, so all of these live shells, uh, we, we made, that was actually challenging. We had to bring in uh, the Marine Corps to handle that, and we had those set up on a uh, drill press uh, that was remotely operated, and we, uh, basically the archeologists, um, were behind very, very thick plexiglass with the Army Corps of Engineers, and they said they drilled a hole with a water spout going through the drill, and they very, very slowly drilled these things out and tried to dampen any gunpowder that would be within. Um, just because they're underwater for 150 years, it does not mean that they are inert. Um, now, the chances are unlikely, but for any of you relic hunters out there, if you find one of these shells in a dry area, there's a very good chance it could still be um, a live piece of ordnance. Now, we also have quite a bit of other ordnance that came out of this wreck. We've got grape shot, uh, which is basically around a stand, and it would have canvas covering and they would fire that, the canvas would burn off and it would turn into basically large bird shot that would rip through the crew. It would do less damage to the ship, but more damage to the crew. Then we had canister shot, which is just like it sounds. It's in a canister. It's like a big soup can filled with tiny balls. Basically really, really deadly bird shot, but for, for people. And they would fire those and it would just wreak havoc on the gun crews. Yeah. So the main point we are trying to communicate with the Westfield Artifact Analysis is that there is so much information that can be gained from what seems like a pile of old twisted metal. With proper excavation, documentation, and conservation, what may seem like a pile of garbage to an untrained eye can provide a wealth of information for the archaeologist. But in making this point, we can't emphasize enough the importance of archaeology and especially conservation for collections like Westfield. In addition, there is absolutely no point in the archaeology if the information isn't shared. So we want you know everyone who's interested, everyone living in the local area, uh, to learn about the significance of this ship to local history. So I just wanted to thank you guys for having us and also thank you for coming out and listening. Thank you all for being here.